Hello everybody, I am Ajit K. Mishra, your course instructor for Literature and Coping Skills. I am here again with a new module on Taming Substance Abuse. Substance abuse, as we know, has been one of the biggest challenges facing the entire human civilization. It has been a major problem for all of us those who abuse the substances and those who do not abuse substances. We all have faced the blues of substance abuse because it has destroyed generations, families, societies and then the world at large. So it has emerged as one of the biggest challenges today. Although it is a big problem. Many often it is not regarded such a huge problem by most of us because one of the biggest issues with substance abuse is that it has been an underground problem. Most often this problem is not reported. Most often we are not able to detect or determine or diagnose and that's one big reason why substance abuse has been an elusive problem. But substance abuse still threatens to eliminate our generations. Therefore, it's very important that we take care of this particular challenge and this particular psychological and mental challenge so that we can take care of this particular problem well before it turns out to be an unmanageable uncontrollable um, giant. So in this module, I'm going to talk about uh, a few very important things that are associated with substance abuse. So let's start. This module, like the previous ones, is also divided into four sections. I'm going to walk you through each of these sections in these lectures. So, I'll be starting with the first section that is the culture of escape, illusion or illusion. And it has two parts. The second lecture will also be on the same thing. Then I'll take you to the third one in which I'll be taking an example of Charles Baudelaire's Be Drunk to talk about substance abuse and the other dimensions associated with it. And then finally, I'll take you to Charles Bukowski's The Suicide Kid. And we'll get to see how the problem of substance abuse is taken care of or not taken care of in that particular poetic composition. Today, I'm going to talk about this particular thing. That is the culture of escape, illusion or illusion. So, when it comes to the culture of escape, substance abuse plays a major role because escape has been one of the biggest causes or the willingness, the desire to escape has been one of the biggest causes because of which people generally look forward to substance use, substance misuse and then finally substance abuse. So, if you get to understand the culture of escape, it will help us understand the very nature of substance abuse. So let's take a look at each of these aspects. We need to start with the idea of what substance is all about. So what is a substance? So when we uh, call it substance, we mean those drugs those things that exercise a negative or an adverse psychological impact on us, on our mental setup. So, substance is any psychoactive compound which has the potential to cause health and social problems, including addiction. So, any psychoactive compound that can cause health problems and social problems as well because uh, there will be concomitant social problems as well. And any psychoactive compound 
that has the potential to lead to addiction is a substance. And then substances may be legal, like alcohol and tobacco. They may be illegal, like heroin and cocaine. And they can also be controlled for use by licensed medical prescribers, such as hydrocodone or oxycodone. They are basically painkillers that subside extreme or severe pain. So, a substance can be illegal, legal, and then a substance can be acceptable under certain medical prescriptions. So, this definition uh, was uh, given to us by Thomas McLellan, psychologist. And then when we come to the real issue, the real problem, when we take a look at the globe that we live in, our world, which appears to be extremely beautiful when we take a look at it, but the moment we get to know that this world has been invaded brutally by substance abuse, then we feel like there is a big problem, there's a big challenge right in front of us, which we need to negotiate, which we need to overcome if we have to survive and make this existence or life better. So, these are some of the figures that will definitely force us to think about this problem seriously. The number of illicit drug users reported in 2015 stands at 246 million. That's a worldwide number of substance abusers or illicit drug users. And people suffering from drug use disorder or substance use disorder, the figure that we have from the 2019 survey stands at 35 million. And all these figures are based on the UNODC, uh, United Nations Office for uh, Drugs and uh, Crimes, uh, UNODC figures. So on the basis of these figures, we can say that substance abuse or drug abuse is rapidly turning out to be one of the biggest concerns for humanity. If we do not wake up to this particular problem, if we do not devise ways to overcome this particular problem, then it will be extremely difficult for us to take care of ourselves and people around us. So it's very, very important that we get to know substance abuse extremely well so that we understand the problem and then we can think of devising ways to overcome this problem. So, on the basis of uh, WHO uh, expert committee definition, we can say that substance abuse is persistent or sporadic excessive drug use which is inconsistent with or unrelated to acceptable medical practice. So any amount of drug that is not acceptable according to medical practice can cause huge physiological and psychological problems. So therefore it's very, very important that we, we uh, understand, we realize that there has to be a persistent or even sporadic but excessive use of drug or any substance that is not medically acceptable. Then there is another definition given to us by the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association that says that substance use disorder is the persistent use of drugs including alcohol. So, DSM-5 says alcohol is a drug as well. Despite substantial harm and adverse consequences. 
So, despite uh, somebody realizing that it can cause substantial harm and adverse consequences to somebody's physiological and psychological setup, if a, such a person continues to use it persistently or in an excessive manner, that will lead to substance use disorder or SUD. So, if we focus on these two very important definitions of substance abuse or substance use disorder, we find something very, very common between them. The focus is on persistent use and excessive use. And there is also an emphasis on any type of use that is not medically acceptable. So, we need to understand that substance abuse leads to severe health conditions, both physical health and psychological health. And it finally alters our well-being conditions as well by severely uh, denting our well-being and our wellness. So it's very important that we take care of substance abuse. So therefore, substance abuse can be defined as a pattern of harmful use of any substance for mood altering purposes. And this mood altering can go either way, either to lift the mood or to depress or to uh, suppress disturbing mood. So any, any amount of substance that is taken to um, alter our moods is an instance of substance abuse. So, it becomes a pattern of harmful use, although it leads to actual alteration of moods, but it turns out to be extremely harmful for the users. So, substance abuse also refers to excessive use of a drug in a way that is detrimental to self, society or both. This definition includes both physical de dependence and psychological dependence. So, when a person becomes physically dependent or psychologically dependent on any drug, so that the person ends up using that particular drug excessively and thus posing a serious threat or challenge to oneself and the society then that's an instance of substance abuse. So, substances can include, as I have already told you, they can be uh, illegal substances, legal substances, or medically acceptable substances. So, substances can include alcohol and other drugs, illegal or not, as well as some substances that are not drugs at all. For example, there are solvents, there are synthetic drugs, so, there are a few uh, uh, such substances that are not treated as drugs at all. But, if somebody uses them excessively in a harmful manner, that can also be called substance abuse. So, when we look at the substance abuse pyramidal structure, we get to see that substance abuse actually uh, affects a person's behavior and a person's personality as well. So, it's very, very important that we get to understand how somebody's behavior is severely affected or influenced by substance abuse and how somebody's personality is also altered under the impact or influence of substance abuse. So, there are several cases in which criminal or antisocial behavior patterns are found among substance abusers. And then, whenever somebody is under the influence of a drug, such behavioral patterns generally surface or crop up, antisocial or even criminal behavioral patterns. And then, when somebody is under the influence of drug, for a prolonged period that will lead to personality changes 
and such persons. So, substance abuse seriously influences behavior patterns and personality types. So, therefore, it is very, very important that we also uh, watch out for this particular effect or impact. That brings us to substance types, which we need to understand that substance or substances have been divided into various types, starting with the first one, that is stimulant, the first type, that is stimulants. They are also very popularly called, colloquially in fact, called uppers because they speed up the function of the central nervous system by speeding up the communication between the neurons and the central nervous system. Therefore, they are called stimulants because they stimulate your condition, your mood by speeding up this neural communication process. So, neuroreceptors, neurotransmitters, they, they all are greatly activated, they are super activated and there is an enhanced um, communication between or among these neurotransmitters, neurons, neuroreceptors and then uh, the entire body feels stimulated. So, they are called stimulants. And then there is a second type that are called the depressants. They are popularly or colloquially called downers. Downers because they slow down the function of the central nervous system. Unlike uh, the, the stimulants which uh, uh, up the function of the central nervous system, the depressants down the function of the central nervous system. So, they exercise a sedative influence on the central nervous system. You feel drowsy, numb and then the entire body comes to a resting position. Unlike uh, the body that is restless, supercharged, super activated under the impact of the stimulants. Then there is a third or one that are called hallucinogens or psychedelics as they are very popularly referred to. So, these hallucinogens affect our senses and change the way we see, hear, taste and smell or even feel things. They create a veneer of hallucination right in front of us. So, that everything turns out to be unreal or um, a hallucination and then uh, we are transported to a very different world. We do not even realize what is happening there. We sometimes move out of ourselves and uh, we may be communicating with ourselves because we are under the impact of this hallucinogens. So, these are the hallucinogens. So, these are the three major substance types. There are other types as well, but for the sake of convenience, I have classified them into three categories or three types. The stimulants, the depressants and the hallucinogens. So, these uh, uh, types uh, can further be uh, explained as, uh, uh, for example, stimulants. Uh, stimulants, as I told you, they speed up the messages between the brain and the body. Uh, a person begins to feel more awake, alert, confident and even overly energetic. So, these drugs uh, increase the user's level of alertness, pumping up the heart rate, the blood pressure and the breathing and blood glucose levels also go up. So, that is the impact of the stimulants. Everything is stimulated, the entire body is stimulated, the brain is stimulated. 
So a person feels super confident and super active, super charged, super energetic. There are a few very popular stimulants like caffeine, cocaine, ecstasy drugs like MDMA, nicotine and amphetamines. So out of these stimulants, uh, nicotine and caffeine are very very popularly used. The tea or the coffee that we all take, they suddenly lift our mood whenever we feel down. Our mood can be lifted by the cup of tea that we sip or the cup of coffee that we sip. So they are mood lifters, mood enhancer because they are stimulants. So these are the stimulants. Then if we focus on the depressants, as you know by now they are called downers because they bring the, the consciousness level down, the level of uh, anxiety or stress down by exercising a numbing effect on the nervous system. So the depressants slow down the messages between the brain and the body, unlike the stimulants which speed up the messages between the brain and the body. So the depressants do not necessarily make you feel depressed. So the slow messages in fact affect a person's concentration and coordination and then a person's ability to respond to what's happening around him or her. So these drugs in fact offer a sedative experience to users, making them tempting, uh, a tempting choice for teens who wish to escape everyday stresses. So escape, illusion or illusion. So there are a few common depressants, there are alcohol, cannabis and opioids. So they are generally uh, depressants which exercise a sedative impact or influence on the users. When we come to the third type that is hallucinogens. These hallucinogens are generally, I mean, a class of psychoactive substances which change our sense of reality. They alter our sense of reality so that we can have hallucinations. Our senses are completely distorted. The way we see, taste, smell and feel things turn out to be completely different. Uh, for example, uh, I may see or hear things that are not at all there or I may also have unusual thoughts and feelings under the impact of these hallucinogens. So uh, a few uh, examples of hallucinogens are cannabis, uh, ketamine, LSD is a very popular hallucinogen and then a few others yeah, as well, uh, especially the magic mushrooms or psilocybin, the magic mushrooms. So these are the different types of drugs or substances that uh, leave a terrible impact on our consciousness levels, our behavior patterns. But the question is why substances? Most people say, yes, people feel good, people um, help themselves overcome the attacks, the onslaughts of stress, anxiety, trauma and depression. Therefore, there is nothing wrong in going for substances and especially when people say that there are certain instances, there are certain types of substances that are medically prescribed. So there are several arguments in favor and against the use of substances. When we try to sum up these uh, arguments, these popular arguments, we can list a few under this particular question, that is why substances? The first is to feel good. We generally feel good 
under the impact of substances. That's why people say they use substances because they turn out to be mood enhancers, mood lifters. For example, the stimulants, they are mood lifters and mood enhancers. So that's the reason which people give in favor of their substance use, which ultimately turns into misuse and abuse as well. This is one. And the second is to feel better. We feel better, therefore, um, we can take to substances. For example, somebody is struggling with stress or anxiety, which cannot be managed otherwise. Therefore, the person suddenly switches to some substance and under the impact of that substance, the person is able to forget. The person enters a state of oblivion, forgetfulness, and then forgets the pain and suffering. To do better is also another major reason why people use substances, because there are occasions when uh, people come under tremendous pressure to perform uh, in a certain uh, situation. For example, athletes, cricketers, they have to perform, they have to excel their opponents so that they can win, they can ensure victory for themselves, as a result of which they take two substances to do better or to perform well. That's another reason. And then this important thing, the subculture curiosity. The subculture curiosity which is tremendously present among the teens, the youth, because they want to belong to the subcultures so that they can identify themselves with those practices, with those communities. As a result of which, most often, especially the teens and the young ones, they give into the, the enticement, the attraction of substances. The logic that is given for such practices is because others are doing it and there is nothing wrong in doing that. Everybody else is doing that. So you can give it a try and a variety of other things. So all these assumptions are actually based on the National Institute on Drug Abuse of the National Institute of Health. So to feel good, to feel better, to do better and to explore the subculture everyone else is using. So there is nothing wrong if I use it. So that uh, tells us that when it comes to, uh, to the feel good component of substance abuse or substance use, uh, most abused drugs in fact produce intense feelings of pleasure. And that's one big reason why people want to give it a try. They want to feel good. If in uh, substances like cocaine and uh, uh, the other uh, stimulants, they leave a tremendous lifting experience on the users. So the initial sensation uh, of euphoria is followed by other effects as well which actually differ with the type of drug being used. But it does lead to an initial response or sensation of euphoria. So the pleasure level is so high, it goes up in such a manner that people think it's worth it. And that's one big reason why in order to feel good, people use substances. Then again, in order to feel better, as I told, there are many people who suffer from social anxiety and stress-related disorders, uh, depression and a variety of other problems or psychological problems. And when they use these substances, that helps them minimize the onslaught of the pain and suffering, thereby helping them find a relief However temporary that relief may be, but they do find relief by using these substances. And then uh, 
as I told you, there are people who want to do better, therefore they, um, in order to improve their performance and their cognitive abilities as well, they take two substances. They want to chemically enhance their performance level and that's one big reason why they take two substances in order to do better. And then finally, the subcultural curiosity and with that logic, piece of logic, because others are doing it. So, adolescents and the youth are particularly vulnerable to this type of attitude, this type of motivation. So, because uh, there are people who engage in risky and uh, daring behaviors to impress their friends and to express their in independence from parental and social rules, people generally take to substances. Because the subculture tells them, um, asks them to be rebels in their own rights. So in order to rebel, in order to uh, show or express their independence, from parental or social controls, such people take to drugs. So that's the motivation. So these are uh, the most important motivations. And then we come to the major substance use disorders. According to the DSM-5 of APA, these are some of uh, uh, the symptoms or the signs of substance use disorder. Taking the substance in large amounts or for longer than you are meant to. I have talked about it. So, using substances excessively or for a period that is longer than the prescribed limit or the prescribed period. And then when somebody struggles with this particular desire to want to cut down or stop using the substance but not being able to do so or manage that. Then we know that's a substance use disorder. That means the person is experiencing SUD. All these are the symptoms, signs of SUD. And then spending a lot of time getting, using or recovering from the use of substance. That means the impact of the substance continues to be longer on somebody's uh, body and mind. And then when somebody begins to crave and experience urges to use substance, when substances become a craving, then that's an instance of SUT. And then when somebody is not being able to manage to do what one should do at work, home, or even school or college because of substance use, if somebody is not being able to focus, concentrate, perform uh, in their professional and personal lives, then that's also an instance of SUT. And then continuing to use even when it causes problems in relationships. When somebody begins to value substances over relationships, then you know that the person has become an addict. The person cannot live without substances. And therefore, the person is suffering from SUD. There are a few uh, other signs and symptoms. For example, giving up important social, occupational or recreational activities because of substance use. That means you gradually withdraw from your public life, your social life, even personal life. So you leave your work, you leave your social life and then you do not find the recreational activities enjoyable at all. That's an instance of substance use disorder. And then using substances again and again, even when it puts you in danger. When somebody knows that the substance use can put somebody or does put somebody in danger, even then if the person continues to use, that's an instance of SUT. And then continuing 
uh, to use substances even when you know you have a physical or a psychological problem that could have been caused or made worse by the substance. And that's a very, very serious um, issue if somebody is already struggling with some uh, mental or psychological problems or even physical problems and when a person takes to substances under such circumstances that can lead to some serious and devastating results. So therefore the person has to be aware, has to realize that substances are a big no in such conditions. I mean they are a big no in all other conditions as well, but this can mean disaster for them. And then uh, needing more of the substance to get the effect you want. So when people begin to use and continue to use substances, they, they become tolerant of those substances. They develop the tolerance level. That means they need to increase the dose, the amount, in order to feel the impact of that substance on them because they, they become, um, you know, uh, insular to those uses. So in order to experience the impact or the influence of such substances, they go on increasing the amount and that leads them to uh, some serious consequences. And then finally, development of withdrawal symptoms, which can be relieved by taking more of the substance. So once somebody becomes an addict, the addict begins to show withdrawal symptoms because one cannot be under the impact of substance all the while. The moment the impact of the substance disappears or vanishes and you begin to return to your senses, normalcy, that's the moment when somebody behaves like somebody is um, you know, experiencing withdrawal symptoms. If you remember, I talked about withdrawal symptoms uh, while talking about heartbreak. So that's exactly uh, what I was pointing towards. Addicts show withdrawal symptoms, terrible withdrawal symptoms, because the moment they return to their senses, they begin to show withdrawal symptoms. So in order to take care of their withdrawal symptoms, they need to consume more of the substance in order to relieve themselves of the onslaught of the withdrawal symptoms. So these are some of the major uh, indicators, uh, symptoms of substance use disorder. So if you take a look at uh, the, the entire lecture, you can quickly recall that I talked about substances, substance abuse. I also showed some global figures to wake you up to the call of the substance abuse. And then I also talked about different types of substance abuse or, or substances and then the major indicators of substance use disorders. That's all for uh, this lecture. Thank you for joining me when I meet you next with my next lecture on this particular issue. I'll be talking about the other dimensions of substance use and substance abuse. Thank you for joining me.